Um, all right, so the Bradford talked about HMC. Really, really powerful, but sometimes you can run into issues where you're trying to run on complicated distributions. And the, probably the, the most, uh, the easiest distribution that's really complicated is the Richelieu distribution. Because uh, it's kind of unique support. But that also makes it really useful. So what I'd like to introduce here is just some, some tricks we can do on that support to simplify the problem to allow us to run these really complicated markup chains to get our efficient sampling and, and do so without introducing any really extraneous computational demands. So uh, the reason why we're going to see the regional distribution everywhere is because of this idea that keeps popping up in a lot of modern problems and statistics. And that's having some, some conserved quantity. Right? So we have some conserved quantity that we want to distribute. And that's going to be critical to the problem. The canonical example here is some finite number of balls falling into bins. Right? We've all seen this as a standard histogram. Uh, but this could also be a discrete quantity, I'm sorry, a, con a continuous quantity that we're distributing among some finite collection of bins. So this can either you know, this be a histogram, this could be a probability, which is why we're going to see it over and over again. So this kind of problem, pretty ubiquitous, it's everything from mixture models where the responsibility of every point on the mixture components follows, you know, it, it has this conserved probability feature. Uh, the categorical problems, where the characterizations of every one of these items is distributed with some conserved probability. Right? And it, these are the kind of problems that are something very, very popular when we're looking at, you know, um, um, you know, trying to look at network analysis, uh, trying to look at large collections of people, these, these kind of large machine learning problems. And so these are typically models with the Richelieu distribution, as I said before, here in its canonical form. And the reason is the support, right? It's this guy right here. Oops. The, uh, the linear summation constraint directly incorporates that conserved quantity into the problem. So instead of having to add some ad hoc characterization, we have one already. And you can see in this canonical form, these are probabilities, right? So it sums to one, and each one of the individual discrete components is conserved between zero and one. Right? But if we want something else, we just have to scale it, not a big problem. So the issue is we, we, we have our, our problem, we've identified the conserved quantities we want to model, we throw in our Dirichlet distributions, but then how do we actually use them? Now, typically, if we just want to draw samples, we can take advantage of the unique property of the gamma distribution. So we draw an ensemble of gamma variants, we normalize them, and that ensemble is a sample from the Dirichlet distribution. It just happens to be this Q property. This is fine if we want to draw samples from a posterior that's a Dirichlet, right? But if we have some non-conjugate likelihood, that's not the kind of sample we want to draw from. We want to draw from some you know, posterior predicated on a Dirichlet. Uh, now, if anyone's tried to do this, you know, rejection sampling from a prior with the likelihood, it never works. So I've seen something a little more complicated. Um, now, we can try to take the same approach and model some latent space U that are gamma variants, and then just keep normalizing the variants at every iteration. That kind of works. But you can see what happens if we run a say, Markov chain on that latent space. The chains interact only through that normalization step. And what tends to happen in practice is that normalization slows down the mixing of the chain and leads to really poor performance. So what's really going on here is that linear summation constraint means that we're not looking at an m-dimensional space, rather this m minus one dimensional simplex, right? So this is where our distribution lives. If we try to sample from an m-dimensional space, we're always gonna have too much information, too much freedom. We always have to somehow project down. And it's that projection that keeps, that slows down the mixing of the chain. So what we wanna do is try to parameterize the simplex directly. Relatively straightforward problem. And so you consider what the simplex looks like in large dimensions. Right? So these are just projections. But you start seeing how complicated the simplex gets as, as the geometry increases, because there's an exponential increase in complexity. And so not only do we have this difficult problem trying to parameterize that simplex, well, if we want to run HMC, we have to bounce off these boundaries, right? If we want to have this little trajectory comes in, bounce, 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 bounce. We have to understand completely that boundary geometry. 
right? Which this is 12 dimensions, right? Not fun. So we need to find some way of simplifying this problem if we want to take advantage of these very efficient Markov chain algorithms. So the trick is pretty simple. <coughs> we want to consider not the original various x, but their square roots. Right? So what does this do? This takes the linear summation constraint to a quadratic summation constraint. Right? That takes the simplex to a hypersphere. Right? Hyperspheres are something we can work with. They're easy. In particular, we can parameterize that hypersphere with hyperspheric coordinates. Then if you get a few more work with high dimensional spaces, just the straightforward generalization of spherical coordinates that's typically seen in calculus. And what happens here is the constraint on all the hyperspherical angles decouples. And that interaction is entirely limited to the radial coordinates. Right, so that, that summation constraint entirely determines what this variable is, and that these are independent. So we can go ahead and marginalize out the radial coordinate, just a delta function. And we get our parameterization of the Riesle distribution in terms of the hyperspherical angles alone. Right, so all we've really done is a straightforward uh, coordinate transform and kept the Jacobians around. So we can see. Because we're parameterizing the simplex directly, I'll be with, with the transformation in between, we get m minus 1 independent distributions. Right? There's now no more coupling between the variables in terms of this complicated geometry and bouncing. So it's very easy to run a Markov chain on this space. Right? They just bounce on this kind of orthogonal boundary, uh, and, and so there's no real issues. There is, however, a problem with these guys right here. Right? Sines and cosines are transcendental functions. They're non-trivial to calculate on a computer. And so if we have you know, 20, 30 variables, we're looking at 40, you know, 80 uh, evaluations of these guys. Not too bad, but if you're on a big problem, these add up really fast. Because every time you need to evaluate the density, you have to compute all those guys. Um, and it doesn't sound hard, but when you look at the difference between computing them and not computing them, it starts building up really fast. But we can get rid of these guys by considering one more transformation. So we consider not the hyperspheral angles themselves, but the square of their sines. And that takes those kind of nasty, awkward, trigonometric distributions to betas. Right? Magical betas that everyone knows how to work with. So not only do we not have to evaluate the sines and cosines, but we also have nice moments here. Right? So if you look back here, what's the mean and, and variance of that guy. Well, it's really messy. So we have all the moments, which are actually useful if you want to tune your Markov chain algorithm to a priori. We have a lot of nice, nice benefits there. So not only do we have the, the density as being quite simple, but the combined mapping going back and forth. Right? We took a square root, uh, and then we did this, this, these uh, hyperspherical angles. But yet, yeah, when you put everything together, the mapping from x to our new parameterization z is just done in terms of products and divisions. And so not only can we evaluate and run our chain fast, we can map it back and forth into the two spaces that quickly. So in particular, there's now nothing limiting us from trying to apply this approach to big problems, which are going to be where they're actually very useful. All right, so as I said before, these applications of the Dirichlet can be really common almost ubiquitous every time you open up a new machine learning book. Uh, I'm just going to go over two examples that I've come across in my own research to give you kind of a flair of what you can do. So for the first example, consider trying to fit histograms. Right, so we have these two shapes in red and blue. You can call them signal or background if you want. And we have a measure spectrum in gray. And what we want to do is calculate the normalizations of these two shapes to best fit that better spectrum. If we knew the shapes exactly, it's not a hard problem. Right? We just build up a two-dimensional posterior and we're done. The more interesting case, and in fact the more common case, is when the uncertainties on these shapes are non-trivial. And what tends to happen in practice is that if you want to calculate these shapes, you need an auxiliary data set where all of the events are tapped. Right? Or how else can you build up what red and blue are separately? 
right? And that tagging means that that auxiliary data set is much more expensive. And so the uncertainties on these shapes are not only not trivial, they're also much larger than the statistical uncertainties of the untagged data set. So if we want to incorporate those, what do we have to do? We have to build up a big joint posterior over not just the normalizations, but also all of the shapes, and then marginalize everything out. Uh, but we can do that because then we now just have efficient means of generating the Dirichlet variables. And once, once the normalization has been factored out of the two shapes, they have to sum to some constant value. So there's immediately the application of the Dirichlet. We build up our big joint posterior for the normalizations, uh, and then the actual shape variable. We can compute uh, samples from the joint posterior, marginalize over the shape information. We can also turn the problem around and consider what happens to the shapes once we've looked at the untagged data set. Right? And because we're considering this problem coherently, we can learn about the shapes from that untagged data set. You can see we get dramatic reductions in the uncertainty before the dark and after in the slightly less dark um, posterior distribution of the shape. Right? So not only can we incorporate those uncertainties, we actually reduce them quite a bit. And no matter the size of this histogram, we have a relatively linear algorithm for incorporating that three flake constraint. Now the other problem is deconvolution. This standard problem of measuring some spectrum that's really a mixture of some true spectrum. This is one of the, the most notorious ILFOS problems. And that for any given measured spectrum, there's always an infinite number of true spectra that satisfy the system of equations. Right? So in order to well pose the problem, we have to introduce prior information, typically uh, some kind of constraint on the length scale of this true spectrum, or how smooth it is. But there's a, another piece of information that's rarely used that can be quite important in kind of smaller one-dimensional problems. Convolution is a mixture process cannot create or destroy events. So if there are n events in the measured spectrum, there had to have been n events in the true spectrum. Right? This is a conserved quantity, which we can incorporate into the problem. Right? So if we model the true spectrum with the Dirichlet distribution, we were immediately incorporated that constraint. Right? But now, what about this transfer matrix? Just like the shapes in the previous example, the transfer matrix is never known exactly. You have to calculate it. You have to calculate it from an auxiliary data set that's been tagged. So you have the same problem as before. The, trans the uncertainties on the transfer matrix are typically much larger than the typical statistical uncertainties on the measured spectrum. Right? So we have to incorporate those. But again, check out how the transfer matrix is created. You take your tag data set, you bin it in the true spectrum, and say, take the TJ bin, all those events falling in there. And then you see where they reconstruct, right? One, two, three, two, two. That has to sum to one, because we're not creating or destroying events. So the columns of the transfer matrix are also modeled with Dirichlet distribution. So if we want to build up this joint posterior, we need a Dirichlet distribution not just for the true spectrum, but also for every single column in the transfer matrix. Because it builds up really fast. But because we can do that efficiently, we incorporate everything together and calculate our problem or calculate our final inference without too much computational difficulty. Here are just two examples of what you can do. The first really demonstrates what that constraint buys you. So here's a, a steeply falling, so that's the log scale. So this is an exponential distribution that involves into the red spectrum. And notice the shoulder right here. Right? Those are events coming from below the analysis threshold that just reconstruct high. If we just model these bands independently, there's no way to correct for those. Right? Those have to stay in. But if we impose this conservation constraint, we can also calculate or model what these bits are. Right? And by modeling all of these bits together with that conservation constraint to regularize the problem, we can remove these leakage events, dump them back into this first bit right here, and get an accurate deconvolution. If you're doing a like, spatial pro uh, process, this isn't as much of an issue because the boundaries tend to be separated from your regions of interest. Uh, the, the conservation constraint tends to get washed out. But in 
big deal, right? This dramatically changes the shape of your distribution. And then you can consider you know, just a standard peak finding problem where two peaks get deconvolved or get convolved into a univariate measured spectrum. And with no a priori information about the multiplicity or the, the number, sorry, the multiplicity or the, the shape of these two peaks, we can deconvolve them consistently. Right? And, and the reason I really show this is that both of these problems were hit with the same code with no tuning. By being able to incorporate these giant posteriors, we can put all the nuisance parameters in and marginalize out over them. Right? So we can handle both steeply falling problems with very small length scale and these kind of more linear length scale problems all at once. So it's not a nice feature to have. And these are just, again, just two of the many examples that are becoming more and more common, uh, particularly for these large problems. So there's a potential benefit for this kind of being able to do this with these efficient Markov chain algorithms is huge. And because we've done so without the addition of kind of unnecessary computational burden by having, say, transcendental functions around, uh, we can, this, this potential benefit also scales to larger problems. And if you read the literature, these larger problems are becoming more and more common as, as kind of data analysis get more and more ambitious with these huge you know, swaths of big data. So, uh, I think the, the point can be made that by thinking kind of efficiently uh, and making sure that we're not, by, by making the problem feasible, we're not making it hard. We don't have to limit the ambition of data analysis and in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Are there questions? So, personally, Doing deep convolution, yes, I think it's a pretty major step forward because getting up things is really crucial. Yeah, and for, yeah for fit, this is the kind of problem in high energy physics, and it's a, no one does it right. By the way, I said it. So I might have thought that Dirichlet distributions aren't always what you want. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, um, this is adapt to um, other possibilities. So, would it, would it, in terms of having a conserved quantity? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like prior distributions. Uh, um, thing, uh, I think, I mean, you could play games for trying to transform into a linear simplex, right? If, once you can get that, then this takes you to somewhere efficient. No, no, I mean, you're still dealing with uh, probabilities, right? There's still a simplex, it's just you don't want to do it. There's a distribution. Oh, a distribution right. So, you can play games. So, for example, the multinomial you can get by kind of transforming the Dirichlet around. Um, I think that the trick is to kind of, if, if you have that kind of problem, separate out into two problems. Have a latent space that lives on the simplex, and then have some other space that either is auxiliary or kind of transforms that simplex into the constraint you actually care about. No, no, I mean the yeah. same constraint. You want a distribution over probabilities. Right. Like one. It's just you don't want the Dirichlet distribution. You want a different distribution. Right, right. But I, I, I think there's, there's games you can play by building your model up where you let the Dirichlet kind of be uniform on the simplex. And then you have some other distribution that handles what the actual distribution you care on the simplex is. But the bend, I mean, what you're really doing here is just parameterizing the simplex. The reason isn't as critical, it just happens to be the most common one that's used. Uh, are there further questions over there? <coughs> So apropos of the picture you have up now, mm -hmm. uh, the first time we saw that picture, I think you mentioned that the nice thing is for cruising this with HMC, uh, you can just sort of go in a straight line until you ricochet off the, the boundary right. and come right. back in. Um, and this is easier to do on an octant of the hypersphere. Right, right. My question is, why do you need to bounce at all? Couldn't you simply parameterize by the entire hypersphere and whenever you're computing a likelihood or anything else, just plug in the absolute value. Right. So you never bounce, you just cruise around. So, so you can play that game, you get a bunch of Jacobian factors that come in. It's not a, because you're, the square root, right, introduced in, is it's, it's another transformation in between the variables you care about and the ones you want. Because the original Dirichlet has that positivity constraint already. Um, it's not hard to do, it's just bouncing is a little, not having those Jacobians are a little bit nicer because you don't have absolute values hanging around here. 
right? It, it, totally possible, um, but it's having those boundaries is nice. It keeps everything contained, easy to tune. Thank you so much. And then we'll move on to the next